Oh, do we have a good show for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Kevin Kev is in the passenger seat. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> You're funny. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> Me and my six-pack. Now the six packs up in your gut, boy. <laughs> the six pack, the twelve pack, and the twenty four pack. What about, what about the keg? <laughs> like, I'm not going. I'm going to be blinded not saying yeah, where that all is. All right. Anyway, tonight we got a great show for you, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to have George Lutz on for the next hour, and uh, we also have a special guest coming on the show. Maybe some of you know who this is a lot of you probably don't know who this is uh, but we're going to be having on joel martin and uh, joel was a local long island new york radio personality who cl was closely involved with the amityville case and was the first reporter to show up at the defeo murder crime scene now can't get it anywhere else <laughs> okay yeah. you really can't this is as straight to the sources we can go. Right. I mean, you know, if this guy doesn't tell the truth, then forget it. I'm just going to, you know, throw my hat in. Joel will discuss some of his experiences surrounding the Amityville Horror case, and uh, they're not good. They're not good. He, uh, he has a lot of interesting stories to share with us, and we're going to be talking to him uh, probably right around 11 o'clock or so in the next hour. Also, after that, which uh, any of you who are on the mailing list, and if you are not on the mailing list, I suggest you do so. If you go to the website at www.lougentile.com, click on the mailing list. Basically what's going to happen is, is I think this is going to turn into a three-hour show because those of you who are looking on the video feed right now will see that I have the letter, or shall I say letters, from Butch. DeFeo that he sent me. So we're going to be reading those live on the air, and there's some very, I'll just say, interesting information. Put it to you that way, nice and light. Uh, John's office may be calling in. I'm not sure. John had to uh, actually do something tonight uh, because it was kind of unexpected what happened. For those of you who don't know what happened last night, uh, we had a caller. As a matter of fact, um, the caller, John, if he's listening right now, he can call into the show. Uh, John was actually going to, th this caller, John, uh, was asking George Lutz a question. And not even two seconds into the response that George Lutz started talking, everything here went down. Everything, power, everything, internet connection, server, you name it, went completely down. And... Uh, it took, you know, 30 minutes for me to finally say, you know, th this is absolutely ridiculous. We're going to have to reschedule this. I mean, because it, it, there was no viable explanation for it. So um, basically what happened was is that I had, they had all, I had contacted both uh, John and George, and actually the caller had, actually, had called in after we had got the power restored here and everything. And next thing you know, he goes ahead and, um, you know, or I went ahead and told everybody, hey, look, you know, we're going to have to cancel till tomorrow. When I disconnected with all three of them, and Kevin was standing here when it happened, everything came back. Absolutely everything. And then we went on the air for like maybe 20 minutes or so talking a little bit about it. And uh, that, that's, that's what happened last night. And uh, the file, for those of you who don't know, that was uh, on the computer. No, nobody put it on there because you can't get through this firewall. Sometimes I can't even get through it. But uh, the file that was left on the system, uh, which is the archive in real player or real media format, was 666-TLGS-323 or 332, I'm sorry. And for those of you who are curious, tonight's show is show number 333. So, with that said, let's get on with George Lodge. George, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you? Oh, I, I'm, I'm doing okay. <laughs> Best I could do, I guess, compared to what happened last night. 
Did you put in an announcement that um, the fellow that called in last night is never to call your show again? That's right. He can never call ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, George. Hi. How are you? I'm good. All right. Now let's uh, let's take this call because I believe this is John. Uh, you're. Oh. Hi, it's John. Do you believe it? <laughs> well, did you just hang up on him? I just I just hung up on George. Are you? Ah, is this John? Yeah, it's John. All right, John. Hang on a second, okay? This is uh, amateur night as well as Amityville night, so anything goes. All right, hang on one second. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back to the Lou Gentilly Show. We have George on the phone as well as John. All right, John, go ahead. Get it out of your system. What do you have to tell <laughs> him? Get this over with. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to address sort of what the skeptics uh, in general say about ghost stories and paranormal sites. Is it? They, you know, they try to claim a logical or medical condition. You know, something like a hypnagogia or waking dreams or hallucinations to explain sort of things that happened to Lutz family. And, you know, I just want to know if if that was posed to George, you know, how would he respond to it? God, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I thought about this after we got hung up on last night, mm-hmm. and after uh, it was obviously going to be no more radio show last night. The the thing that came to mind first was that the you want to call them the pressures of being a newlywed or having a business and a new family and all of that, um, I think kept me very grounded in some practical ways back then. And then Kevin and I talked about it quite a bit um, during one of the breaks while we were trying to get everything going. And I guess I really didn't understand part of your question. I think I understand it a bit better tonight. I was reminded of two specific instances where, let's say that was possible, that that was more of a dream than reality. Right. And yet, the way I recall it, there's no part of it that was a dream. Okay. Um, was was there a point when you, woke, when you woke up the next day and you said, you know, I wasn't really sure what happened last night? Or was well, it the problem busy? is it didn't wake up. The, the problem is I stayed awake a, okay. after this went on. And okay, all so there was really no waking dream involved. It was just right. reality. Right. You, um, even when I look back at it now, I kind of wish it was a dream. Especially house, but there's one good part to this and one bad part, and we'll do the good part first, if you wish. The uh, When Kathy and I were levitating, we were talking to each other. Okay. We're looking down at the bed, and it was empty. Um, that was a pleasant experience. That was not a frightening experience. It was disconcerting in, in that it was new and uncomfortable and, and pretty unbelievable, even while it's going on and you're seeing it and you're participating in it and you're conversing and talking about it. And after we were back in bed next to each other, we looked at each other and said, did that really happen? Just for confirmation from each other. But I, I, I really can't think of that in terms of a dream right. okay? um, because we were cognizant through it and talking to each other and carried on a conversation while it was going on. And One of disbelief, but still. The reason I ask is because I'm sure there are a certain percentage of, of, of paranormal reports that can be attributed to things like waking dreams where um, and it's attributed with like paralysis and having terrible nightmares and afterwards not really being sure what happened. But, you know, I know that feeling things like cold spots in your house, that's not, that has nothing to do with the waking dream at all. I can think of a waking dream as such uh, years later in terms of a nightmare where I'm talking in the middle of the nightmare, and I'm already in California for, uh, let's say, two years. Okay. Um, that's a, that, would, that would, to me, would be a, a waking dream nightmare kind of thing. I, I experienced, I've, I've had them in the past, so I know what they're like. I had, I had one where I was, I was paralyzed for, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 seconds, and there was a woman at the end of my bed. I thought she was my dead grandmother the next day. I, I wasn't sure whether it was reality or whether it was a, a dream, and I couldn't tell. That's, that's sort of the way they are. So that's why I was, I was posing the question. You see, John, the one thing I'd point to is that the big way to tell when you're looking at something that has to be paranormal and not a hypnagogic hallucination is if you have more than one witness seeing something, right. it's not hypnagogic. It can't be. I agree. All right. And during the nightmare, the for example, Kathy would wake me up, but I really was not awake. I was back in the house, and 
that was one of the most frightening things to be back there and feel that I couldn't get out of there. And Kathy was hearing while this was going on. Kathy was hearing the uh, a woman speaking, saying, "Where's my George? Where's my George?" And I was just trying to figure out a way to get back to where, out of there, get back to wherever it was I was supposed to be because I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. So I don't know what you'd call that, a, night, a really bad nightmare or just um, some form of hallucination. I don't a know. bad day for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, I, I mean, I still recall it. This is now 20 years, more than 20 years later since that one, but I still remember that night. Mm-hmm. So you, know, you never like you never looked at it the next day and said it was this real. I mean, it was always real as far as you was concerned, right? Well, that certainly that experience was. Even though I knew my body was asleep, there was no part of my mind that was. Right. It's amazing, and, I, and I'm sure that uh, while you were in the house, George, you you had, I, I guess, similar dreams. No, see, I won't use the word dreams. Kathy had the dreams. I didn't have them. Kathy had dreams uh, about. The order of the murders, where the where the the Fayol family was was shot, um, who was shot first, um, the time that they were shot, and different things like that. She, I mean, she literally relived that in her mind in her dream state. And I don't know. We never had a way to know whether those dreams were accurate or not. Whether they were you want to call them bleed through throughs in, in time of some kind that were really showing her what really had happened. All we could ever say is this is what she experienced. This is what she came to believe happened. Doesn't mean that um, forensics or science would show otherwise, you know, or would, would confirm it. I right. really um, that wasn't the troubling thing. The troubling thing was that she would even dream these things. All right, John, does that answer your question? Yeah, I have another one if you hear it. It's much a simple question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I've heard rumors that you're going to either make uh, a new website or possibly a book or, or maybe even some type of a documentary. Is uh, is that going to happen, or what's the chance of that happening? Because I have 20 bucks to spend on a student's book, and there's no way i do that. So i got to spend it somewhere. Uh-oh, see what I tell you. Here we go. <laughs> uh, for more than 20 years, I've wanted to do the uh, a, a picture book of some kind with an explanation of the uh, house the way we left it uh, the, that'd be the picture book of the all the different photographs that were taken the day of the investigation uh, and we will do that I don't know when that will be um, I had thought that we had that worked out two years ago uh, as you know that I didn't come about um, it will happen, and it will happen within two years, but the question is just when and how. I'm not really sure what media to put it on and, and how to think of it. What I'd really like to do is is put it on um, AmityvilleHorror.net when we get that up and running and then um, just have it for people to see, and if they want a CD of it or whatever, make one available for 5 bucks or something like that. I really don't... Um, I think a lot, a lot of people will be looking forward to it, for sure. I really don't want to think of it in, a, in terms of a commercial venture as much as just making the photographs available. Right. Uh, as far as a book, no. Um, we tried that a couple of different ways. We, we do still have the original Campaign of Terror, which is a very large book. That was the sequel that the writer left um, <laughs> after it was done and after a, um, I mean, what would you call it, an advance Advanced negotiations had already been completed with um, Prentice Hall, and then it was removed from the market because of all the legal problems at that point with the author leaving. Uh, We own the copyrights for that, so we will be transferring that book to um, probably the same website and probably the same way you can read it there or you can download the whole thing, figure something out with that, because I think people would really um, should have those stories, should know what happened to the other people. So those, those are two different projects that I'm not sure how we'll handle them as an end result, but um, we're certainly trying to figure something out to make have it make sense and not have it be um, 20 bucks a copy or anything like that. Okay. I'll be waiting. 
All right. As far as a movie goes, that's just um, that's always a dream till it happens. So who knows? Okay. All right. All right, John. Thanks for the call. Thanks for taking the call. All right. We can speak with George Lutz tonight, 888-777-8488. That's toll-free, 888-777-8488. And uh, let's take another call. You're live on Lou Gentilly Show. What's your question for George Lutz? Hi, George. I was just wondering something. Um, when did you feel that um, all those horrible episodes pretty much ended? Was it after you moved out to California? When I look back at it now, I think that many times we thought it was just plain over. Um, mm-hmm. Many different times there were we just we'd have um, quite a few days of peace, quite a few days, even weeks maybe, without the severe headaches or the nausea or the mm-hmm. draining sensation where you just have no energy at all and you have no physical ailment, nothing, no illness or anything like that. But you just have you just are drained. Um, yeah. We would have weeks of of peace, and we would say to ourselves, you know, looks like you know. It, you dare to think that maybe it's over that way, in that sense. Or the kids would have good night sleeps night after night after night so that yeah. you would start you, to feel safe, and then a few things would happen, and um, you would know better. Yeah. Do you feel now that you're at a place where you can finally say, whew, it's over, or I guess it's never... Uh, well, you know, in one sense, it's always been over from the time we left there. Yeah. In, in that sense, what I mean by that is that that was the beginning of severing the direct physical and psychological link with the house. Mm-hmm. Um, it was years later when we met Reverend Neil Smith, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury's exorcist for the Anglican Church in England. We spent time with him. Um, we prayed with him. We, I hate to say it now, but I argued with him for quite a few hours, and it was mostly about words and semantics. Finally, he got me to agree to go into the chapel in his church and pray with him that we could both agree on and because the way I thought of things the way Kathy thought of things and the way he thought of things were 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 different and it was a it was a problem for a couple hours with us and he's a lovely man he's an really an incredible individual Um, and Mm -hmm. in that church that night he said prayers with us, for us. He did a, a blessing. Um, and there was an incredible relief at the end of that night. You could feel a, a real lifting right. from it all. It, that doesn't mean that it all just quit right then and there, but so much of it went away that if there's a biggest turning point after leaving New York or or getting out of the house, it would certainly be that. Oh, that must have been horrible, but... Um yeah. Well, actually, it was kind of wonderful that it happened. Really? Yeah, it, that it, that it was over. That that oh, yeah. part of it, that yeah. uh, meeting him, that was just one of those gifts from God that you mm. are grateful for forever and and never understand how it came about. Wow. The way we met him was um, that we were being interviewed by a New York Times, I'm sorry, not a, a London Times reporter, and her name was Dani Brook, and she had written a book on child natural childbirth and. Mm-hmm. she uh, was interested in our story and she was interviewing us about our story and she re- she mentioned that she knew Reverend Neil Smith and we just begged her to meet him. Um, right. And uh, the following year we were back in, in London seeing him again, but that time it's totally social and having dinner with him and his family. Wow. They were really wonderful people. Well, thank you, George. You're quite welcome. And thank you for sharing your story with everybody. Take care. God bless. Bye. All right. Thank you. Well, John Zaffis uh, joins us now. John, welcome back. Hi. How you doing? All right. Hey, John, you're back to bother me some more, aren't you? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So how, how are you doing, John? Doing okay. Yeah? Not bad. Not bad. All right. We were just uh, recapping some of the things that happened last night, and... Uh, Took a couple calls that uh, person John called in and was Oh, no. Everything didn't crash again, did it? No. No. Okay. Say that again, Kev. Well, there weren't the two Johns on at once, so you didn't get that double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we're taking your calls for George Lutz at uh, toll-free 888-777-8488. That's toll-free 888 888- 
seven 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 eight four eight eight. And um, now, God, that's annoying. Yes. I wish that's that mine. That's my phone. No, that's mine. That's mine. I, I know why it does that, but someday, <laughs> someday, maybe it'll it'll get taken care of. But anyway, um, George, as far as um, Butch DeFeo is concerned. I know there was a, a point where you actually tried to get him some help. Uh, is it possible you can you can elaborate on that a little bit? After Kevin and I left the house, okay, we sat <laughs> tapes for ourselves, not the kind of tapes you would ever want anyone else to listen to. Mm-hmm. And they were for our own sense of well-being, psychological undoing, <laughs> different things that had taken place for one of us and that the other had no idea. It was a discovery process also. In the process of doing that, we came to the conclusion that Raul DeFeo sitting in jail for six consecutive life terms would be a real... Tragedy, again, it would further the tragedy. Very least, he should be afforded psychological help, psychiatric care, and we made arrangements through friends of ours. Mimi Vetter was uh, a good friend of mine, Joe Vetter, who was at our, they were at our wedding that earlier that July. They had been over the house while we were in the house. She knew William Weber, and she, or a way to get a hold of She knew DeFeo's attorney, and she made inquiries about whether he would be willing to talk with us, and we eventually met him and sat down and spoke with him, hmm. always with the understanding that that was the reason why we were meeting. So, in other words, you you actually believe that that there was there was something going on with this that he could have been very well possessed. Absolutely. Okay. John, what what uh, what stories had you heard uh, about Butch DeFeo being possessed, and, and all the times that uh, you had discussed the Amityville Horror? Uh, one thing that I'd like to ask George before I answer that: George, did did he agree to the uh, counseling and the psychiatric help? I don't think. William Weber, as DeFeo's attorney at that time, ever made any moves towards such a, a thing. They never even tried to seek out I have no reason of... to believe that he did. Okay. Just I have curious. no... Wait, I'm, not, I'm not privy to any information that he did anything in that way. Instead, what happened was that by the time Ed and Lorraine went into the house and the second time, there was a contract that had been delivered to our house that um, Weber and his partners, Mars and Burton, wanted to do a book deal and a movie deal and use our story as part of that. They wanted us to take lie detector tests, and if we failed the lie detector tests, we were not to receive any money from this venture. And Ronald DeFeo was to uh, receive monies from this. And... The whole idea of all of that was just, they, they even at one point wanted us to donate the house to their corporation. Um, that was, the whole idea was just not something that Kathy and I would agree to. Okay. I was just uh, curious with where he went as far as, um, you know, uh, that, where, were they even attempting on uh, his behalf to try and get him any psychological help or, you know, any type of guidance. Well, representations were made to us that there was an appeal in process, that there was an automatic appeal of some kind that would be taking place, mm-hmm. that, this, that any information we supplied would, would be helpful towards that possibly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were introduced to a gentleman by the name of Paul Hoffman, who eventually wrote the Good Housekeeping article. Mm-hmm. Um, and did it without our permission. He was introduced to us as a criminologist working on this case. Turns out he was a writer. 
We didn't under we didn't know that until what was it April of 1977 when he when the story came out in Good Housekeeping about us. Um, yeah, these they, these are this is quite a group of um, interesting individuals. Yeah, I should say. I, I think the one thing, uh, Lou, in answer to uh, your question, and hearing so many different arguments, if you will, so many different theories, so many different things that took place the night of, uh, of the murders. It, it, it's astounding to me today, after all these years, that no, none of the neighbors heard any of the shots. Well, John, I got a surprise for you. Uh, I have tonight on the show, he's going to be coming up on the next hour when George uh, leaves us, uh-huh. Joel Martin. Have you heard of Joel Martin? Um, Probably not rings. a familiar name to me right now, no. Okay. Joel was a uh, local Long Island, New York radio personality who closely, who was closely involved with the Amityville Horror case, mm-hmm. and he was the first reporter on the scene. And he has some very, very first-hand knowledge of the interviews that took place with all of the people and neighbors and friends and all that other stuff. So he he's going to... He's going to be explaining that to us when he comes up uh, on the second part of the hour. Okay, it's definitely. That good. It's it's believe me, it, it's gonna it's gonna blow the doors off a lot of a lot of people's opinions about what happened. I believe he knew Kaplan rather well too. Yes, if I remember correctly. Yep, and uh, he didn't exactly didn't exactly uh, condone what. Stephen Kaplan was doing. I wasn't inferring anything. I just I think oh no, I've always just... thought that he. Knew him. Yeah, he he knew him, but he 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 didn't really condone what he was doing as far as calling the Amityville a hoax. Because even uh, Joel will admit that there have been some very odd, strange, and bizarre things that have happened surrounding the Amityville horror case with the people who've been involved and things like that. But all right, I got to take a short break, guys. And uh, when we return to the Lou Gentilly Show, we're going to be speaking more with John Zaffis and George Lutz, and we'll be taking your calls toll free at 888-777. Speaking tonight with George Lutz and John Zaffis. We're also taking your calls toll free at 888-777-8488. That's toll free 888-777-8488. And we're back with John and George. And I want to get into uh, some of these email. I tried to sort them out. First one I'm going to do here is from uh, Bill Bonfiglio from New York. And he asks, George, uh, there have been allegations that during the time you were residing at 112 Ocean Avenue, you had gone to the police station and told them that you were having thoughts of murdering your family. And you turned your gun over to them. Is there any validity to this allegation? And if so, what are the details? I've heard this before. Um, I don't know where to start. That, back in when we were in New York and I had my business there, I had a cash payroll. I had a license to carry a concealed weapon. Um, that's not an easy thing to get. It was limited to Nassau and Suffolk County and upstate New York. It was not valid in New York City. So any time that I went to New York City, I had to either leave the gun at home someplace or in a car or at a police station. The police station always seemed to be the best option. So very often I would go and it just became a habit. You stop by the police station and you drop it off and you tell them when you'll be back. We went to New York and, and I dropped the gun off. So that allegation is, is false then? It's pretty ridiculous. Okay. All right. Toll free, 888-777-8488. That's toll free, 888-777-8488. We're speaking with John Zaffis and George Lutz. Um, George, where do you think the Amityville Horror is going to be in 25 years from now? Do you think it's going to be as widely publicized, and do you think it's still going to remain one of the most popular hauntings in human history? Where do I think it will be in 25 years? Mm Mm-hmm. Do I have a marketing plan for it for no. 25 years from now? Is that <laughs> no, no, part no. of the underlying question? No, it's, no. 
I mean, what what do you what do you think? I couldn't have imagined you... 25 years ago that I'd be sitting at home on the telephone talking about this to a live audience. I, that's just not. I don't think about that. It doesn't occur to me that that that's something important to worry about or think about. I, I don't know. I, I, maybe that's not the answer you want, but. Well, let me ask you this. 25 years ago. We spent 25 years trying to put together a normal life and, and live fairly incognito where we are. Mm -hmm. um, 25 it's, a, it's, a, it's not a comfortable thing to be recognized when you go to the grocery store. Right. And I have a great deal of empathy about that, and I'm glad that that's gone away for the most part. So when it does happen, most of the time, I guess, you could consider it a pleasant surprise, but it's it's like, okay, um, but thank God it doesn't happen every day or every week or every month. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what that kind of life would be like, to not be able to live like a private citizen. Well, 25 years ago, was it different? It was never a good thing to go out of your house and worry about who's going to cost you next. Hmm. All right, let's uh, take another call. You're live on the Lou Gentilly Show, and what's your question for George Lutz? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering um, if I can ask uh, George, how much of uh, the movie did uh, was realistic? I mean, how much, how, how, what I'm trying to say is how much uh, of what happened in the movie uh, really took place? There's quite a few things in the movie that never took place, never happened the way that they were depicted in the movie. Now, would you say the, the, the flies on the priest, did that happen? I don't think that Father Ray ever spoke about flies on him. The flies did happen in that room constantly, in the upstairs sewing, what we refer to as the sewing room. Mm -hmm. um, those, they were there pretty much from the time we moved in. But they weren't in swarms like in the movie. Uh, okay. Now, um, the toilet bowl flushing blood was was that anything like that ever happened? No, no, not like that at all. The toilet bowls did turn black, mm -hmm. and the, on the first floor and the second floor, and they had started to on the third floor when we had left. When we left. Hmm. Wow, creepy. The, just the inside of the porcelain. Oh wow! But the complete bowl. Hmm. The Blood running down the walls? No. The One of the things they left out was that there were drips out of the keyholes on different doors, especially on the second floor, that they were like a hardened substance. They were black. It was like a teardrop, and they would grow longer. They would grow larger. And so as time went on, they, they, got, they actually grew while we were there. Now, the cross on the wall, did that turn upside down? Yes. Yeah, that did, that did happen. Wow. Hmm. And how long was uh, uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren involved when, uh, and what, at what point did you call Ed and Lorraine to come visit your house? Actually, Laura Dadeo set that up from Channel 5. Um, I still don't understand how she came into our life and, and performed so many wonderful things and then it just seemed to be the right person in the right place but she had a rapport with them and she understood them to be the professionals that they are and she took it upon herself to get a hold of me and especially after seeing I think Kaplan's interview in the newspapers and on TV on the 18th and 19th of February and she explained that he had no credentials, and, and but she did have people that did have credentials, and she convinced the Warrens to come down and go through the house the first time by themselves with her, so she accompanied them. She was an assistant news producer of some kind for uh, Channel 5 News in New York, mm -hmm. and then the Warrens put together the team that went in later. Now, before you bought the house, were there any early warning signs that told you that maybe, you know, I shouldn't buy the house, you know, that maybe there's something wrong here, or, or nothing ever went through your mind? Sure, it went through our minds. Uh, 
and in this sense, we wanted to first of all know if the kids were going to be bothered by this in some way. If, if they had objections, we would not have bought the house. Mm. So as a family, we sat down and discussed it at length. And I'm not saying today that that's the best solution that someone would do, but that's what we did then. We sat with them and we explained that the family had been murdered there and they had seen the house, they had been through it. If they had any reservations or any reason in their minds that they wouldn't be comfortable in there or in, in any way, we wouldn't have moved there. Hmm. So that was, the, that was the decision before buying the house in that sense. Does anybody in Amityville today still hold any ill will towards your family? Oh, I would have no idea. You would have no idea. I'm told that there are quite a few, but I really don't know. Because hmm. I, you know, I understand that that town was, uh, that, I mean, after the movie took place and after the story took place, now Amityville, you know, as soon as you say that name, everybody links it to your story. Oh, and I'm sure there were times, and there still are, when they wish we had never moved in there. Uh, and I can certainly understand that I, I would never have wanted to be my neighbor hmm. and then have all the years after that. Hmm. All right. Th thank you very much, George. Lou, keep up the good work. All right, man. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. All right. Thanks for the call. Bye. Toll free, 888-777-8488. That's toll free, 888-777-8488. George, have you, have you uh, within the past 25 years, went back to Amityville at any point? Yes. Was there any kind of uh, hard feelings with anyone there? Oh, well, no one knew I was there. Okay. And I imagine the house has completely changed today, correct? Uh, from the pictures I've seen, yes. Okay. Well, I can speak for that because I was there about two months ago. Oh, yeah? When I was working in the general vicinity on a case, naturally, you know, you want to see the Amityville home. And um, the whole side is done. The uh, curved windows, those are uh, replaced. The pool is gone. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's a new boathouse that's out there. And, um, so, you know, you can still tell that, you know, it's the home just by driving by it from all the pictures from over the years, but, I mean, they have done some remodeling. George, were you ever at the uh, at the house that they blew up in Toms River, New Jersey? No. No? Just checking. <laughs> that's like that was right one of those sets I wasn't invited to. <laughs> that's that's right down, uh, it's actually right down the street from our house. No way. Have that yeah, that's funny. Because when I met my wife, it was like, uh, yeah, this is the Amityville Horror House. I'm like, I'm like, that's not the Amityville Horror House. She's like, oh, I know. It's the one they blew up in the movie. I'm told they uh, that was an A-frame and they converted it somehow. All I know is that she said that they blew it up and it's completely different than the way it looked. They didn't really blow it up, though. Yeah, they did. They did? Yes, completely I leveled. Know, I, I didn't know that. Yep, the house in Tom's River was completely leveled and uh, they built a new home and the family that's there now i mean you know it's, it was it was a movie so i'm not i'm not i mean not expecting that they have a haunting or anything but you know they built the brand new house on it and you know it's eerie how it actually looks like amityville you know the pictures at least that i've seen because if you look at the backyard they have a boathouse now they didn't blow that up and you know it's still got that look to it if you know what i mean but uh, anyway, we're taking your phone calls, 888-777-8488. That's toll-free, 888-777-8488. We have a couple minutes left uh, with George Lutz, and then uh, that's it. So uh, get your questions in now. Uh, John, what, what, did, what did you find that when you were growing up with your aunt and uncle, whenever they brought up Amityville, did you at all think that, you know, maybe this wasn't true, maybe it was true. Was there any kind of skepticism in your mind? or No, the reason being, Lou, is you got to remember, when they were working on cases, I was always fortunate enough to be around, and Ed would always say, John, listen to this, listen to this. Right. And I, you've heard me say this before, where I heard before, you know, anything really ever hit, where books, you know, and... Uh, the movies or anything really hit when 
uh, Ed and Lorraine actually sat down with Kathy and George, and they were talking to him about different things. Right. Or it was over the telephone. I can't remember exactly what it was on the uh, audio tapes. Mm-hmm. And you, and I, I just remember sitting, listening to the different things, and as you know, uh, my uncle will stop the tape and start telling you what he feels with his input and what he thinks was happening to the family at that point in time. So you got to remember, at that point in time, it was considered just a case. It, it was just a, a case in Amityville, Long Island at that point. So a, a, as things progressed and I would hear these different things or uh, the movies would come out or, you know, you'd hear about the book, you read the book and different things, I mean, then everything would start getting twisted and turned and, you know, some different things would come into perspective. But did I ever doubt the validity of the case? No, because I remember the original investigation when they went in and hearing them discuss and talk about the different things that transpired. So, no, I never doubted it for a second. Hmm. And actually, George, I don't know if you ever go on my website or if you've ever been on there or not, but I do talk about the Amityville story on there in the very first paragraph. I state that in there that <laughs> I heard it ever since I was a kid, so I knew it was real. <laughs> uh, it's been a long time since I visited. Is it warrens.com? Uh, no, I was referring to mine. I have my own website. No, I haven't. John. Okay. Everybody has a website today. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, John. Plug your website for George. <laughs> okay. <laughs> www.prsne.com. P-R-S-N-E. P-R-S-N-E. Okay. Yep, that's www.prsne.com, as well as uh, warrens.net. All right, George, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. I think you enlightened a lot of people. I think that, uh, you know, you've, you've spoken from your heart, and I, I think that uh, this, was, this was a great interview, and I do thank you for the opportunity uh, of giving me an interview that, uh, you know, basically set the record straight on a, on a lot of different issues. Lou, I want to thank you. I've done... and. And everyone there, uh, absolutely. You are among the finest people that I have ever been interviewed by, uh, and the most polite and most patient. Um, I don't know how many of these I have done, probably someplace between 60 and at least 100, somewhere in there, Mm -hmm. uh, worldwide, and you have made this very pleasant. Thank you. All right. And someday I'll make a promise to you I'll come back and I'll talk about just the last night in the house. (laughs) <laughs> hey George, uh, well, I've never I, done that. Uh, I'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> hey George, I also want to thank you. You've been a great guest. Well, you just you guys are, are real gentlemen, and I appreciate it. I, I've seen every kind of interviewer there possibly is, and and you guys are on the top as far as I'm concerned. All right, thank you very much, George. Thank I appreciate you. that. Bye. All right, have a good night. Bye. Well, John, that was uh, George Lutz. Yeah, that's it amazing. Was, uh, interesting over the past three evenings to uh, talk to him, to hear his views. Uh, what means more to me than anything is the uh, the the amount of information that came out, and with George speaking forward, I think after twenty eight years, some of the controversy will be put to bed. I, I think so too. I mean, you know, especially with with uh, Lorraine when she w- was talking with him, you know, for the last two nights. I mean, they brought things up that you know nobody ever heard before. Right. You know. Right. And uh, I, I mean, this isn't people think that it's made up, John, and and maybe it's because they're not involved with investigating the paranormal. Maybe it's because they still have a closed mind. But one of the things that gets me about this whole thing are the people that say, yes, I believe in the paranormal, but I believe that the Amityville Horror was a hoax. But they forget about the family that went through the nightmare. They forget about the Lutzes. You know. And, and what, yeah, another thing, too, that you know, to this day always bothers me is that uh, I'll always hear you know, or get a, a bizarre email or something, Lou, and you know this, this bothers me tremendously, is that I will hear that Ed and Lorraine made it up. <laughs> And, you know, it, 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 to me, this helped to put a lot of it to bed. Yeah. And, and I'm very, very 
glad that it happened. Uh, it, the me- weird it means one. a tremendous amount to me because it, it's totally ridiculous when people make accusations like that when in the beginning, I mean, they really didn't have an actual tie-in with the movie or, you know, they, yeah. they didn't actually make any money off of the Amityville horror there. So, I mean, they were making their living at that point in time off of the, doing their lectures. Well, uh, I mean, you know, Ed and Lorraine had their own had their own thing going. You mm-hmm. know, a- Amityville, Amityville kind of, you know, it, it gave them a little push, but they had their they had their own thing going on. They sure did. You know, been involved most, in a lot of other important cases. Yeah, I mean, most people don't even understand that. They think that Amityville Horror, just like you know, Ed and Lorraine woke up one day. Ed's a demonologist, and Lorraine is a is a clairvoyant. And next thing you know, they get out of bed and go to Amityville, and they're famous. It didn't happen like that. No, nope, you know? that was the farthest. Uh misconception today that i know of that um you know uh people come up with that and i just sit back and you know me i'll just start laughing yeah. when i hear these stories because i know they're ludicrous they're totally ludicrous in the way they perceive all of it yeah uh, john you're gonna hang around for this right uh, i'm gonna try to <laughs> all right I, I, want, I want you to hang around for this. this is gonna be good this uh the, the guest that we have coming up uh in the next couple of minutes is first-hand knowledge of the crime scene at the DeFeos. And um, he's going to tell you, John, if there were any people, any body, any, any human being within the vicinity of that house that heard those gunshots, he's going to tell us. That sounds good to me. He's going to tell us. And uh, Joel Martin will be joining us in uh, just a few moments after we take this uh, short commercial break at the top of the hour. When we can return to the Lou Gentilly show right after this. Hi. Guest going to join us in a minute, Mr. Joel Martin. And Joel was a local Long Island, New York radio personality who was closely involved in the Amityville case. And he was the first reporter on scene. And uh, Joel will be with us in, let's see, as soon as I get the uh, people stop talking in my right ear. Anyway, Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lou. Now, Joel, explain to everybody what uh, what you were doing back uh, when the Amityville Horror uh, came about. How, what was your involvement? How did you get involved? Well, I was working as a news director and a talk show host for a Long Island radio station in the New York area. I had been a radio personality and uh, on the air for a very long time hosting the show, and uh, one day, um, just as we were about to leave, one evening in November 1974, the phone rang, and I debated whether to pick it up because, you know, the, it was a long day, and it was a ready evening, and I said, ah, all right, I'll pick it up. And it was uh, the United Press International, the wire service desk in New York, and I was a stringer for them. In other words, a, a reporter that would go out and cover Long Island events and then file them for their national desk in New York City, mm-hmm. and then send it on out through the country on what in those years was the teletype before the computer systems. Right. And to make a long story short, when I, I picked up the phone, they said, Joe Martin, this is UBI in the city. There's been a mass murder. Uh, but several people have been killed at 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville. You're the closest reporter we have. Well, I was. I covered it immediately. We got there, and we got there obviously very quickly. And in the years before satellite uh, uh, gathering or equipment, what they call ENG, where they can send signals right back and they have TV cameras and satellite trucks everywhere. It was a little longer, for a little harder for people to get out to the island and reporters to get from the city. I got there very early. When I got there, the scene was just positively eerie. There were police ropes and there were police cars and there was just this terrible, terrible, horrible feeling and just the chill in the air. It was just awful. And eventually more reporters came, and I watched the, uh, the morgue wagon there the, from the, uh, the medical examiner's office take out the bodies, at least of several of the children, apparently. And uh, at one point, one of the children fell right off the, the dead body. The body of the child fell right off the, uh, the, the conveyance they were carrying it on as, as the, uh, the people from the medical examiner's offices were carrying the bodies to the, the van. Oh. And uh, I saw the child dead with a bullet hole, and I just, it was just, traumatic and i was young i was in my early 20s and uh to make a long story short we spent that night there just uh, in fascination behind the police lines and in terror 
And then I got the idea, hey, look, I'm, I'm here not as a, a spectator. Six people had been murdered, a mother, a father, two sons and two daughters, the entire DeFeo family. There was one more DeFeo. The police would not comment. That was Ronald Jr., or Butch, as his nickname was then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked around the neighborhood, and because I was known locally, I was actually, ironically, better known than some of the, the bigger names who came out from the city who didn't know the area at all. And uh, a lot of the kids in the neighborhood knew me from my programs about psychic phenomena and UFOs, and I did a talk show on a rock station, and I found out that a dog had wailed at about uh, somewhere between 3 and 3.30 in the morning, crying. That was the only sound anybody heard. Nobody heard any gunshots. And the kids in the neighborhood, the teenagers and the youngsters, were all saying, Ronnie did it, Ronnie did it, Ronnie did it. Well, that at that point was was a was hearsay, an allegation. It wasn't something you could use for a UPI report, right. certainly. But I could say that the dog wailed between 3 and 3.30. That's the way I filed my story to UPI for the next day. That went around the country, actually, that night, and it was picked up all for the next day. Um, that apparently is how um, the movie later on set the time as 3.15 in the morning. Um, but I'm sure that was accurate because that's when the dog was wailing. And how he did it without anybody hearing is to this day a mystery. But the children in the neighborhood were white. Ronnie DeFeo Jr. did do it. Mm -hmm. And they knew that their Ronnie was uh, you know, on drugs and there was a very, very dysfunctional, violent situation at home. Now, Joel, I, you know, I, I had, we had we'd spoken briefly uh, off air before, and I was telling you that I had... Uh, school teachers and people that uh, had known him and, and things like that and said that you know, he was a little out of control and mentally unstable and yes. things like that. Out of the research that you did, did you find that to be correct? Yes, I did. I absolutely did because I did not know Ronnie, uh, of course, before the, uh, the tragedy, before the six murders, but it turned out after the murders, Long Island, even though it has a huge population, it's like a lot of places, you know, it's, a, it's a, a small town and a big city kind of thing. I found out that there were a number of people I knew who knew Ronnie, some very credible people, and everyone told me the same story. He could go off like a rocket in a moment. His temper could be horrible. Uh, a friend of mine.